Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, OSU Extension Horticulture Educator Keith Reed shows the proper way to calibrate a tank sprayer. We get a behind-the-scenes peek at Karsten Creek Golf Course as they prepare for the NCAA Golf Championships. OSU Extension Entomologist Eric Griebeck takes a look at some of the pests on our squash plants. And host Casey Hinches hills the potatoes in the vegetable garden. Karsten Creek, home of the 2018 NCAA Men's and Women's Golf Championship. And whether you're a golfer or not, I think we can all appreciate the hard work that goes into getting any landscape ready for being viewed by millions of people. About a month ago, we spoke with Karsten Creek's golf course superintendent about what it takes to get a course ready for a big tournament. We are here at Karsten Creek, just outside of Stillwater, and they are hosting the 2018 NCAA Men and Women's Golf Tournament in about a month. And joining us is Travis Levings, who is the golf course superintendent. So Travis, you're about a month away from this major tournament. Can you tell us a little bit about what has gone into the preparation for this tournament? Well, we started, we started about a year ago, and we have done several projects around the golf course. We've renovated our tee boxes and our range tee and our bunkers and just a <laughs> bunch of projects that needed to be done that uh, really helped freshen up the golf course. And uh, we're, you know, we kind of continued that into the winter, and now we've overseeded the rough, and I think everything right now is on schedule to have a good tournament. Yeah, so, I mean, the golf course looks beautiful. We've got a little bit more time for the trees to leaf up a little bit. You've overseeded the um, rough areas. Can you, do you normally do that? No, we don't. It's something that uh, is not a, it's kind of a huge expense for us. Okay. And trying to deal with the ryegrass, trying to get it up and keep, we, we've had to keep mowing rough all winter. <laughs> and I, you know, it's not something we typically do. We usually take, like take the winters off. Right. So a lot of us as gardeners, you know, we like to, have a little more control over the weather. I can imagine that in your position, you know, you're fighting with this late winter holding on with these late frosts and stuff. What impact is that having on your your responsibility here? Right now it's having a huge impact. Uh, the cold weather, the lack of rain, we've really had to fight to get this the ryegrass up and to grow and uh, even the, the warm season grasses really aren't doing anything right now. We've got a <laughs> I'm hoping for some good weather for this next month so we can green everything up. So we've got ryegrass in the or in the uh, rough areas. What are your greens and your fairways consisting of? Our greens are SR1020 bent grass. Uh, they're green usually year-round. Uh, they don't grow much over the winter, but starting usually in March or April, and they'll grow until about mid-November, December. Uh, our fairways are Meyer zoysia. Okay. Uh, very similar to Bermuda as far as the season it grows, mm -hmm. but uh, it usually greens up a little bit quicker than Bermuda, so our, our fairways are green. They're not perfectly green, but they are green. And of course, if you mow them a little bit shorter, then you're seeing a little more of that green growth near the ground coming exactly, up. Exactly, yeah. All right, so so about the sand traps, where I would probably be if I was a golfer, can you, can you elaborate on what might be going on with the sand traps? Okay, one of our projects is we went in and we pulled our old sand out and we had a fabric liner underneath the sand to kind of help hold the sand on the face. Mm -hmm. uh, we went in and we put a porous concrete underneath the sand and then put new sand on top. Okay. Uh, the porous concrete allows the water to go through the sand and not pull the sand off the face and uh, helps dry the sand when it's really wet. Some of them are pretty steep. Yeah, some yeah. of them are very steep. But uh, the sand, that capillary concrete 
the porous concrete will help hold that sand in place. And I think a lot of times, you know, as homeowners, we always think, oh, I want to have a yard that looks like a golf course, but there's a lot of engineering in a golf course. Absolutely. I'd love to have a yard that looks like <laughs> My yard at home doesn't look like so this. So you actually, your history, you were working for a company that built Karsten before you started working here. That's you right. know about the engineering here. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of things underground that nobody ever knows are there. The yeah. irrigation system, the drainage system. There, there are lots of things underground underneath a golf course that nobody ever knows about. <laughs> and of course, the maintenance, um, I'm sure it's impacted a little bit by the tournament. Can you? Absolutely. We, you know, there's going to be a lot of foot traffic out here and just the, just the day-to-day -day stuff that we normally wouldn't do, like mowing rough, or we've had to mow spots in for tents and walk paths and stuff that we normally don't do that we've had to do for this tournament. We were having to put in some temporary electric for tents that, you know, will never get used again, but we, we need it for May. So you guys have hosted tournaments before, but this tournament is going to be on national TV, the Golf Network, and so that's just making it quadruple the efforts. Yeah, this is so much different than anything we've ever done. Um, the past tournaments we've done, the first one wasn't televised at all, just on the news. Uh, the last tournament we did, it, there was an actual podcast in the last tournament, the last four holes, but you could hardly, you <laughs> didn't even notice those guys were here. So more tents, you got a crane coming in We here? got a TV crane coming in, 110 foot tall. We've got a camera on every hole. We've got a mobile studio where They'll have a shot across the bridge on 18 and up through 18 fairway to the clubhouse. And I suspect that the golf course wasn't designed with spaces for all of this stuff. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, we've had to create several spots to put some of these things in. Uh, getting the crane to its location is going to be a challenge. <laughs> uh, we've, we're going to have to sneak it down the cart path at 17 and try oh, wow. to get him. I think the difficult part is going to get him turned around and get him back out once the thing's over. So not only putting this large crane on the golf course, but also the galleries are going to kind of view this tournament from a different perspective. Can you explain that? Uh, unlike most golf tournaments where the gallery is usually stuck in the rough or in between holes, we're going to let the gallery follow the players right down the middle of the fairway. Uh, the main reason is we really don't have, a, we don't have any gallery space out here. Standing it's wooded all around us, yeah. Standing on the cart path, you're not going to be able to see anything. And we really are trying to keep people out of our rough and not trample our rough down. So uh, we're going to walk the spectators right down behind the players and they'll have a great view of the, how go college golf is played and they'll see some great golf. So what does that mean for the compaction? And I mean, what's the recovery time after a thing like this? Well, we'll I guess we'll find out after it's over. But uh, I, I don't anticipate a lot, but there is going to be some areas we're going to have to... to uh, renovate after we're done. Yeah, and so will you get a, a day of no play out here to help kind of facilitate that? Uh, no, we're not. We're gonna we're open the next morning on the 31st and uh, we've got to get things flipped around and get ready for member play that next day. Well, Travis, as an OSU Turfgrass alum, I know it's in good hands with you at the helm. Thank you for having us out. Thank you for having me on. While our row cover did work for squash bugs so far, it hasn't helped with cucumber beetles. And joining us is Dr. Eric Rebeck, who is our extension entomologist. Dr. Rebeck, what do we need to do to battle these uh, cucumber beetles? Well, first of all, there are, uh, obviously we have a lot of damage on your squash and they do prefer cucurbit crops, mm -hmm. uh, such as cucumbers and squash and zucchini. Um, there's two species that we deal with, um, and you can kind of see both species flying around in the garden. We have uh, striped cucumber beetle and we have spotted cucumber beetle as well. Um, and your floating row covers are actually one way to try to eliminate um, access to the crop for both the squash bug and your cucumber beetles. And I need to mention, we just have left our row cover off because it got a little high maintenance opening it and closing it every absolutely, morning. Absolutely, absolutely. Plus you're also flowering right now and that's when you want to keep the cover True. off because you want pollinators to have access as well so you have fruits. We noticed these cucumber beetles um, about five days ago mm -hmm. and then came back over the weekend and this has happened. Yeah. So they're small insects, but they can really do a number on your crop, crop quickly. Absolutely. So you can see the foliar damage. Um, they kind of skeletonize the leaves as we see here. 
um, through their feeding activity as the, in the adult stage. Right now there's a lot of mating going on too and so egg laying is happening. The females are uh, laying the eggs in the soil and then those larvae hatch from those eggs and they'll tunnel into the roots of the plant as well. So it's a double whammy. You have the problem with the, the, the foliage that's being consumed and then the tunneling into the roots as well. And they're doing some damage on the fruit that we have too. They're kind yeah, of Yeah, they might be sampling some of the fruits as well um, as they're as they're feeding. One also uh, important thing to point out about their biology is they are um, vectors, uh, important vectors of a mosaic uh, virus uh, mm -hmm. that affects cucurbits um, as well as bacterial wilt. And okay. so you get the direct damage and then you have the indirect damage from the, the from the disease transmission. So we don't want these in the garden. We do not want these in the garden. <laughs> so how do we get rid of them at this point? Okay, so at this point what I would recommend doing is um, an insecticide application um, and you can use broad spectrum treatments. Uh, Things like uh, Seven, um, Carbaryl is the active ingredient in that. Um, these are over the counter, uh, re readily available for uh, home use. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also some other broad spectrum compounds as well. Wide variety of homeowner products for uh, for vegetable pest control, for home home fruit and vegetable. And control. they're they're wide broad uh, spectrum, and so we always have to worry about our pollinators. Absolutely. So timing of those applications is critical. Morning would be great, or um, so early morning or uh, later into the evening to make those applications would be perfect to avoid contact with your beneficials, your pollinators, your predators, and your parasitoids. Okay, are there any organic options? There are. Um, so we have uh, kaolin clay. Um, it's a product called Surround. Um, basically it's a chalky white um, solution that you spray. Um, it covers the leaves, it covers the fruits. When it dries, um, it's not impenetrable, but it's certainly a deterrent uh, to, uh, to uh, further feeding okay. by the beetles or from even squash bugs that might still be uh, in the garden as well. And and I want to mention the color on the leaves here is actually just the variety of uh, squash that's that we right. have. But, that's right. So that's not the insect or no, the clay. No, it's definitely this feeding damage that we're seeing here. And you, and yeah, you haven't spra um, sprayed any of your kale and clay. Neem oil is another option. Okay. Another organic option that we can try to uh, put in there as well. That's uh, It's a botanically derived uh, compound and we can put that out, spray it. Um, I believe the label says every few days you can reapply depending and you've had a heyday you brought them out you planted them and when summer hit um, we have this abundance of these beetles and so you really need to stay on top of it and, and reapply um, frequently uh, with those products. And we've noticed in a couple of other areas where we have some squash planted with okra They've sampled some of sure. the other plants, but they definitely favor the squash. They, they do, and that brings up a good point with another uh, management method, and that's trap cropping. So um, they really love uh, Blue Hubbard squash, okay. and so if you can plant around the uh, perimeter of where you're planting your primary summer squash, your zucchini, what have you, um, they're going to feed on that primarily first. And you can direct your spray application or other management strategy to that trap crop as you go. Um, and still be mindful of watching what's happening in the crop itself, of course, too. But it reduces the amount of pesticides that you might be putting on the crop Right on the edible after. crop, mm -hmm. that's right. Um, you can also, in conjunction with the trap crops, you can use cucumber beetle traps, okay. um, which might also be effective uh, for trapping them out. Basically, it's a yellow sticky card that, that draws them in. Um, and they get stuck on that on that, that backing, that sticky um, trap. Okay, all right. So uh, are our plants hopeless at this point? I wouldn't say hopeless, okay. uh, but we certainly <laughs> want to get on top of it. And of course, we're not going to be able to reverse the damage that's already been done. But as the plants continue to grow, they're going to put more foliage on so they'll be able to photosynthesize and, um, and flower and produce more fruit. And then we just need to make sure we watch for any of the disease symptoms Absolutely. of the wilt and stuff. That's exactly right. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, Absolutely, Dr. Reback. Casey. You might have remembered back in March, we planted our potatoes and we did it in a little bit of an unconventional method. We used a tub that we cut the bottom of the tub off. We flipped that tub upside down so that the taper would taper up towards the top. And that's so that when we harvest our potatoes, we'll be able to just slip this right off and harvest those potatoes. Now it's time to start hilling our potatoes in. And typically you wanna do this when they're about eight to 10 inches tall. Ours have gotten a little past that point because if you've noticed, our spring went from basically winter right into the heat of summer and these just jumped up overnight. So they are a little bit taller, but we're gonna go ahead and hill them in. 
The reason why you want to heal in potatoes is because if there's any of the potato exposed, the sunlight actually will burn the skin of the potato and create a toxic alloy in that. Now it's not so toxic that the whole potato is wasted, you just want to cut away any of the green part that you might see. So we're going to prevent that hopefully by healing these potatoes. Um, and also, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and add a little fertilizer. So we're going to uh, mix in some fertilizer in with our potting soil here that we're going to use. Now, many of you might be growing potatoes just in a traditional uh, garden bed. Um, and that's okay if you're doing that. What you're going to want to do is use either uh, soil or compost and kind of bring that up around the base of those plants. We're going to do this carefully, of course, not to break any of the stems. Um, and we're just going to bury that plant. You can see we've almost got our container full of soil and that's going to give plenty of room for those potato tubers to continue growing and be well protected from the sunlight. What I like about the container is it really holds that healed soil up around the plant. You want to make sure while you're burying the plant that you do leave a couple of inches of the plant still remaining above um, the soil line so that it continues to grow and, and photosynthesize and create that sugar for the tuber. So, here you can see um, where our healing is complete and now we just want to make sure to water this in. We're getting into the gardening season, which means we might be getting out and spraying and using our hand sprayers. And joining us today is Keith Reed with the Payne County Extension Office. And Keith, you're going to talk to us about preparing our hand sprayers so that we're using them accurately. What's the first thing that we need to consider? Hi, Casey. I want to talk about a couple of things today. One is just the, the basic setup of the simple little pump up sprayer so that it will be an effective tool for us. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing we want to do is make sure, of course, it's, we've got it pumped up. We don't ever want to pump it up so that it's a bomb. <laughs> we, we don't want tremendous amount of pressure, but we want enough pressure in it that it, it does a good job of applying the product. The second thing I want to do is practice spraying. And of course, I'm using just clean water here, but I want to practice so that my my pattern, my spray pattern is, is doing what I need it to do and that may vary a little bit depending, depending on the product I'm using. And you're talking about the drops I'm talking of about the, the physical size of the drops. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say I'm using a horticultural oil and the idea there is that you smother the insects so you need nice even complete coverage. For horticultural oil I'm going to tighten this nozzle up a little bit so that my droplet size is 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 fairly small you and the that? oil is kind of a thicker material too it, it is that that gives me a nice a nice solid coverage now if i use that same nozzle setting to spray for example a broadleaf herbicide and maybe the wind was blowing a little bit i'm going to run a high risk of of causing a unnecessary drift and i could easily wipe out my, my neighbor's tomatoes in a worst case example. So you would want to so, increase your droplet so size. In, in that, exactly right. So in that case, I'm going to adjust and I'm going to see the, see the difference here. Mm -hmm. Now I don't want to go too far. I don't want to spray like that, but I do want to, I want to just experiment. And I do this on concrete so I can watch it dry and see how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. For the purpose of today's demonstration, Let's say we're going to be applying a herbicide, so I want the larger droplets, so I think that looks pretty good right there. Okay. So after I've done that, I'm going to just step over here on a smooth, dry surface. I like concrete, and I'm just going to practice. And so think of painting a house. Mm -hmm. I go back and forth. I'm shutting my nozzle, my sprayer off, as I make each pass because I don't want to overlap. So I'm just going to practice that as long as I need to until I can come up with a, a nice even repeatable pattern. 
And this pattern's going to vary a little bit with each person, right? I mean, sure. So that's an important point. What I'm doing today is only what works well for Keith Reed because mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of subjectivity in here. I like to walk a certain pace. I like for my width to be a certain width. I don't, I don't want to try to go like this each time because that's hard for me to do a nice job. But a taller person might have a longer exactly. arm and a longer a, span. Exactly, exactly. Now, so. I want to point out, you're walking backwards, and there's a valuable reason for that. Well, of course. So if I was walking forward, I'm just going to be walking through the, the pesticide as I'm applying it. Uh, first of all, that's going to unnecessarily get it on my clothing, so mm -hmm. I want to avoid that. The second thing is, depending on what product I'm using, that could cause additional harm to the plant, or it could uh, render the product uh, uh, less effective. So the next thing we need to do is determine what, I call it a carrier rate. Mm -hmm. We need to determine how much water this sprayer puts out per given area. Okay. Okay. Now, we come over here, we have a little test area set up. So I've used my tape measure and then actually this, this sidewalk crack right here. Okay. So this is an area four foot wide and 25 foot long. Well, it just that's 100 square feet. And it, it's a small enough area. I can do it relatively easily, but it's also a large enough area that I, I feel like my accuracy is pretty good. Okay. If I was trying to do this step over five square feet, I don't think that's a large enough area. Okay. Okay. So I know I have one gallon in here. So I, now I'm going to come over here and I'm simply going to spray my test area. So you've got your 100 square feet finished now with your consistent pattern. What's the next step? Okay, that looks pretty good. So the next step is to actually measure and see how much water we have left in our sprayer. From the one gallon From that we the started. one gallon okay. we started with. So let's come over here and do that. I, say, I like to just pour it in a five gallon bucket or a big container so I know I'm gonna catch all of it. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I'm gonna pour that into a container that has a good measurements on it. Okay. And uh, it's important to mention here, do not go grab a measure container, a measuring container out of your kitchen. Yeah, you really uh, need to have completely separate measuring spoons, measuring cups for absolutely. your garage. Okay, so that is uh, uh, that is uh, two quarts, which would be 64 ounces, and that's full. So I'm just going to dump that out. Once again, it's just plain water. And then it looks like we have... Uh, 16 ounces there. So we had 64 ounces plus 16 ounces. So that's 80 ounces. Mm -hmm. Okay. We started with 128 ounces. Okay. So that tells us we used, if my math is right here, 48 ounces for 100 square feet. Okay. Okay. All right. Of carrier, of, which of, is of, the of water. water. Right. Of water. Yes. Yes. So 48 ounces per 100 square feet. Most of our, our pesticide labels talk about volumes or, or areas in 1,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So if we simply multiply that, uh, we have 480 ounces per 1,000 square feet. Okay. And so once we have that number, that is something that's going to serve us well for the long term. I want to write that on my sprayer, or if I if I garden, if I keep a, a good garden journal, mm -hmm. that's the kind of information you want to put down, so we don't have to repeat this calibration step. Mm -hmm. And then using so using that, now I can go to my pesticide label, and it might say, for example, apply 1.5 ounces per thousand square feet. Well, let's say. What I want to spray today is one small little shrub. Right. How in the world do I know how many thousand square feet that is? And you don't want to mix up a big amount. Right, right. For so, a small space. Right, right. So I can simply uh, uh, refer back to my known carrier rate, and that really establishes a nice baseline, which lets me do a good job spraying no matter what product I might be spraying.
Well, excellent. Thank you for sharing this great information with us, Keith. My pleasure, Casey. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we travel to Stout Gardens at Dancing Tree for an iris tour and a primer on iris breeding. Eric Rebeck is back for our bagworms. Casey and OSU youth specialist Shirley Mitchell create garden bookmarks for summer reading. And Barbara Brown blows in with an air fryer. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.